All right, so I had mentioned, you know, um, throughout that, you know, car uh, carnival is performed or the carnivalesque is performed in South Park. It is a performance of the carnival. Um, you know, it may not be Burning Man or the medieval carnival, but it's about hierarchical inversion, um, you know, that South Park does in so many ways. So in the episode that we just watched, The Hobbit, whose authority is undermined? Kanye West just completely knocked off, right? Like, remember, because he, you know, mainly because he does not know, um, you know, that his wife is a hobbit and, and or fiance is a hobbit, you know, and so his authority, he comes in as authority figure to the classroom, right? And then it, and throughout he shows that he actually doesn't know if she is or isn't, isn't a hobbit. And it turns out she is a hobbit and that's okay. Um, you know, she has the special power of Photoshop. <laughs> it's so funny. Okay, so we're going to go over the chapter, South Park as carnivalesque satire. So in South Park, the mode of representation, how South Park reflects the world is through carnivalesque. All these things that we've been talking about, grotesque fantasies and genres of Billingsgate and scatological humor, excessive humor, all those things, okay? Um, Basically, what South Park tries to do is like take these social and political issues and tries to cross these boundaries. They kind of sit in the middle, which I think is a pretty interesting thing that South Park does do. Now, you may be sitting there and being like, I'm very liberal or a progressive, and South Park episodes align with my ideology. Or you may be sitting there and being like, I'm very conservative, politically, morally, etc. And South Park aligns with my identity. And the fact of the matter is, you're both right. Um, and that's part of, not, not necessarily a tool that South Park uses, um, uh, you know, to get an audience, but it does have that audience, you know, of 18 to 34, of 18 to 50, and maybe even a little bit, you know, over 50, 50 to 60. So, I mean, they're really casting a pretty wide net um, for the show. But South Park appeals to both liberals and conservatives. I mean, you know, you could read plenty of quotes, and I'm paraphrasing, where they say, you know, um, yeah, we fucking hate Republicans, right? But we really fucking hate liberals. Um, and that has to go back to South Park, and, you know, it's Trey, Trey Parker um, being a libertarian, Matt, you know, and also having a libertarian philosophy, but like, you know, they, they really don't like liberals uh, in the sense of like, they feel like liberal and liberal perspectives are often not critiqued in the mass media um, because a lot of celebrities are identify as liberal or more left left leaning. A lot of media industries and companies are owned by more left leaning, um, you know, uh, people. Um, you know, um, so I think that's just kind of an important thing, and this is why it has its success. But what South Park does. And this is kind of fucking genius, you know, is they mock this sitcom lesson learned. I mean, this is the whole thing. I learned something today. You know, they tell you the moral, you know, kind of the moral of, of, of the story, but they mock that element. They parody that element of so many sitcoms where there is like always, you know, some sort of learning moment at, at the end. And that becomes sort of the, the, the point. And, and, and this is where, you know, the author says that South Park is, is, uh, is not like it, what they call an end synthesis, that South Park is dialogic in the sense of, um, of that, you know, like, what you get out of an episode is based upon your view of the world, your positionality in the world, um, your viewpoints, you know, your family background, religious background, all those sorts of things. Um, but it's not an end moment. It's part of an ongoing dialogue and evolution of who you of who you are, and that's very important. If you think about in philosophy, um, you know, synthesis is you have your your thesis, your perspective. It's met with your your antithesis, which is the opposite of your perspective, and then maybe you don't change your viewpoint per se, but your synthesis is the result of that where maybe yeah your your view hasn't changed but you've changed how you think about it how you debate about it how you consider it and that's usually considered an end point dialogic sort of view is that that's not an end point it's just 
an endpoint for now, which is going to lead to multiple stops along the line. Okay, and what South Park does, in, in you know, is it uses the carnival, it uses carnival esque, and it uses shit humor. Scatolo- well, let's be let's be academic. It uses scatological humor. Mom and dad just want you know what you're get you're paying for maybe, or students what you're paying for with debt, with loans. Is you know what scatological humor is? There's a technical term for poop humor, and pee humor, and vomit, right? all sorts of excretion humor scatological humor it's brilliant right these are used to challenge like dominant ideas in society what is considered normal what is considered right what is considered beautiful what's considered smart what's considered stupid what's considered um, you know uh, 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 politically correct all these things right is what South Park challenges okay now I want to talk about a very important character here. Now, we had watched the episode Cancelled, right, that I told you was written by Norman Lear. Uh, Norman Lear uh, wrote All in the Family, and it was one of the main, um, you know, uh, you know, shows that I brought up that he wrote. He also uh, wrote The Jeffersons, Good Times, uh, etc. But All in the Family had a key character in it, Archie Bunker. You may have fucking heard of him. Um, maybe not. The character in South Park who's based upon Archie Bunker is Eric Cartman. Conservative, bigot, racist, sexist, all of these things, right? Uh, Kind of like large, loud, obnoxious. People tend to not like him in so many ways. Um, And the other great thing is Archie Bunker was always in the episodes because of his conservatism, because of his, uh, you know, his, uh, the fact that he was a bigot, right, and narrow-minded and and all this stuff, and that he held these views, he was always the victim of those viewpoints. Always the victim. Now, you think about Eric Cartman, right, he meets kind of all those criteria, and then you see Eric never really truly wins like he kind of wins but he doesn't really come out on top he always is suffering from his own narrow-mindedness his own conservatism is his downfall now I want you to watch this clip I'm gonna put it into the video um, and this is a classic classic moment called equal time where Archie is arguing for less gun control now you'll see kind of how this all comes together and is and, and is a great exemplification of the things that you see in Eric Cartman in so many episodes where he where he positions himself as an authority on multiple multiple things right and then um, through that he ultimately becomes the victim of his perceived authority on these matters so this is called equal time it's about gun control and it's important to note too that Norman Lear um, you know had a lot of liberal viewpoints um, you know in, in perspectives so he wrote this as a as a, a, a parody of, 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 you know, people that held viewpoints and were conservative in this sort of, um, you know, socially problematic way like Archie Bunker. So take a watch. This is called Equal Time. Here we are. Here we are. All right. Everybody oh, clam up. Look what they did Mr. to Mr. Archie me. Bunker. Oh, Speaking in reply to the editorial broadcast last Saturday. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> this is the Archie Bunker room for 704 Houser Street, veteran of the big war. Speaking on behalf of guns for everybody. Now, question. What was the first thing that the communists done when they took over Russia? Answer, gun control. And there's a lot of people in this country who want to do the same thing to us here in a kind of conspiracy, see. You take your big international bankers. Uh, they want to, what do you call, uh, masticate the people of this here nation like puppets on a wing. And then when they get that done, turn us over to the communists. Oh, Archie, I'm now, glad they put you on a stool. You, you look taller sitting down. Now, I want to talk about another thing that's on everybody's mind today, and that's your stick-ups and your sky jackets, which, uh, if that was up to me, I could end the sky jackets tomorrow. You could? All you got to do is arm all your passengers. <laughs> you know what the are? I mean, he ain't got no more superiority there, and he ain't going to dare to pull out no rod. And uh, then your airlines, then they wouldn't have to chase the passengers on the ground no more. 
They just pass out the pistols at the beginning of the trip, and they pick them up again at the end. Case closed. That's incredible, Arthur. 